Tonight, pills, pills, and more pills. Prescription drugs, easy to get, all in the name of pain. Back pain, neck pain, everyone who goes to that clinic would basically come out with the same prescription. Whether that pain was legitimate or not, there's no way to detect. Hardcore narcotics, also easy to abuse. The cause of death was combined drug toxicity from the exact three drugs that he was, had been prescribed by this clinic. And they were? Vicodin, Soma, and Xanax. Those three and only those three. Good evening. Dan Rather reporting tonight from Austin. We begin the program with an investigation of pain management clinics here in Texas and elsewhere. Millions of Americans suffer from chronic pain and the demand has created a booming industry of legitimate pain management clinics across the country. But laws here in Texas and some other states allow prescription drugs, potentially dangerous but legal narcotics, to be prescribed in clinics without a doctor on site. And lack of a prescription drug monitoring program for all narcotic categories has led to drug distribution in parts of the state on a scale never before seen by police. For decades, the war on drugs has focused on drug trafficking from Mexico, Central and South America. But the battle lines here and in other states have been redrawn. No longer is it the border, but the neighborhood pharmacy. And the drugs are legal, FDA approved. <laughs> Here's a couple here. These are only a few of countless prescription pills that the Houston, Texas Police Department has seized in recent years. These were sold for pennies on the dollar to an undercover officer at which time he was arrested. I think there was approximately 10,000 tablets. According to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, nearly 7 million Americans are abusing prescription drugs. That's more than the number who abuse heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, and hallucinogens combined. Here in Houston, police say loopholes in the law have made it all too easy for just about anyone to legally get their hands on prescription painkillers. From addicts who need a fix to dealers who turn around and sell them for profit on the street. Where are they getting these pills? pain relief centers that, according to veteran police officer John Kowal, aren't all operating with the highest of medical standards. There are legitimate pain control centers. Oh, yes. We have pain clinics in Houston that are run by board-certified anesthesiologists that do a complete workup of your personal medical history and what would be best to keep you functioning just on pain medication legitimately. But that's not what you work on. Correct. It's going to be right on here on your left. You'll see the sign for the uh, pain relief center oh, right yeah, there. there is. South the Kirby Pain Relief right. Center. So he calls these places pill mills. If you're not here to see the doctor or go to the pharmacy, you need to leave. All right. Now. Okay. They're often found in strip malls or embedded in nondescript out-of-the-way buildings. Mom and pop pharmacies and clinics working hand in hand giving out potentially addictive narcotics without asking very many questions. For people who don't know what a pill mill is, take us through. The basic definition here in Houston, Harris County, Texas, is usually a storefront operation where people go to to get prescription drugs, a prescription for controlled substances. These pain clinics, or pill mills as they're referred to, don't have to be owned or operated right now by a licensed medical doctor. They could be owned by a lay person. Do I have to be licensed by the city? No. Licensed by the county? No. Licensed by the state? No. Any federal license required? Mm, none whatsoever. So it's a business like a 7-Eleven or a hot dog stand? Exactly. It's just like any of you were going to open up a shoe store. There's no licensing requirement as of right now. Wow. Oh. A lot of them, what we see from the people we arrested from owning these clinics, are your former crack or cocaine dealers from the 80s or 90s who are now getting into the pill business as an illicit commodity. Because the prescription pill business 
is a better business, more money, or? It's more money and you got less overhead that's not have to be imported from Colombia or Mexico or come across the border. It's manufactured here right in the United States. According to Kowal, this is not your typical doctor's office. All you need to get powerful prescription narcotics are identification and some aches and pains. Whether that pain was legitimate or not, there's no way to detect, usually like a back pain, neck pain. They would give you a limited or basic medical exam as far as where you hurt, how did you do it, and then everyone who goes to that clinic would basically come out with the same prescription and that's it. Here you got a little van, a Suburban on your right. People in it just waiting to go to the pharmacy, coming out of the pharmacy. Right we asked police officer Kowal to give us a ride along so we could observe for ourselves. Well, the pain relief center is here and right. the pharmacy is right next door. Very handy. To see how these so-called pill mills really work, you have to show up early in the morning. This clinic won't open for at least another hour, but the line has already started forming. It's first come, first serve, cash only, no credit cards, no insurance. Some show up with coupons like these that give them a discount on their visit. On an average day, roughly 100 people will file through these doors. Some of them suffer from chronic, debilitating pain. They may not have insurance or the money to see a specialist, and this type of clinic is the only place for them. But they likely will be joined by desperate addicts, regulars who walk in frequently knowing they can get their pill fix without much hassle. And then there are the dealers, who bring people in by the carload to help stock up on their inventory. Many of the cars are from neighboring states where the laws are more stringent than in Texas. There's a car from Louisiana right there, just waiting, two of them in a row. They can see that car right there getting out three at a time. Right. This management has hired security to keep these people in their vehicles. It won't draw as much attention if everybody's not sitting in, inside the pharmacy or right outside the pharmacy. There's a group coming out of the pharmacy. And this is a Louisiana car right here. The standard prescription that you're issued at one of the pain clinics that we're talking about is 120 tablets of hydrocodone, and 90 tablets of Soma, the muscle relaxant, and 60 tablets usually of Xanax. Each tablet is worth about how much on the street? Well, starts here in Houston, about three to four dollars. Louisiana, maybe about five to seven dollars, somewhere in that area. Sometimes so we're talking harder. real money. Right. And you're talking about thousands of pills. Most of these pills are synthetic pain relievers, officially called opioids. Drugs in the same family as morphine and oxycodone. Hydrocodone, also known as Vicodin or Lortab, is popular here. Xanax an addictive anti-anxiety medication, and the muscle relaxer Soma are also generously prescribed. Who's behind this? Who makes the money? There's money to be made all throughout the process. You have the clinic owner who's charging somebody $75 for a visit. Who may or may not be a so-called, quote, dirty doctor? Correct. You have a doctor or a medical director for that clinic that's by law is supposed to review approximately 10 percent of the patient charts. He gets paid a monthly salary. That's pretty good, anywhere from five to seven thousand dollars per month just to come in once in a while and review those charts. So he gets his money. There's money in it too for the independent pharmacies who specialize in selling drugs to people referred from pill mills. How many of these bad clinics do you think there are? You're looking at about 200 clinics, and that's just from a rough estimate of what we see on the streets, information we've gathered. And that's in Houston and the metropolitan Houston that's area? That's just within the metropolitan Houston areas. The further you go out through Harris County, you may see a top of anywhere to up to 300 or so. Travel about an hour east outside of Houston, and you'll find yourself close to the Louisiana border. They call this region the Golden Triangle encompassing Beaumont, Port Arthur, and Orange, Texas. In 1901, they struck oil here, 
a 100-foot-tall gusher that lasted for nine days and started the oil boom, bringing wealth to the area. That's where the term golden comes from. But the heydays of the early 1900s ended long ago. Now, battered by the economy and weather beaten by Mother Nature, much of that luster has faded. Narcotics, both legal and illegal, flow freely throughout the depressed cities and towns of East Texas. And many of the products that hit the streets are coming from pill mills. The human cost has been tragically high. In 2007 alone, officials told us there were over a hundred deaths from prescription drug overdoses, and each one has a story. He loved that motorcycle. That was, man, he, uh, he worked on that thing and worked on that thing and worked on that thing. And of course, after, you know, it, uh, he was gone, well, we, you know, obviously there's not enough money in the world to uh, buy it. Ken Scarborough and his wife, Esther, thought of themselves as a typical family. Their eldest child, their only son, Christopher, was fun and outgoing. He enjoyed spending times with friends and family. His father says he was the kind of kid who was never afraid to tell him, I love you, even in public. For his mother, life seemed to be going normally throughout his early years. Well, you know, most parents at some point have a talk with their children about uh, sex and about watching out for drugs. Did you have that conversation with him? Yes, we did, many times. Sometimes I think, uh, and when he was younger, we may have overdone it. Peaked the curiosity or something like that. You know, they have classes for kids to teach them about what drugs to stay away from. And I remember one time he told me that that class made him think more about trying it. Do you remember the first time you knew he got high? It was his 17th birthday and uh, he had gone down the street. We lived out in the country, and he'd gone down the street to a friend's house, and one of the family members gave him uh, two Xanax and a beer for his 17th birthday, and that night he spent his birthday in jail because he was so high that he, uh, we had to call for help to, to control him, and we just, they just took him up there to let him calm down that night. It was easy for Chris, who was popular and charismatic, to score drugs from his friends and convince others it was all just a phase. I work in a juvenile facility and we had kids coming in there, you know, doing things and you think, well, my kid might, won't ever do that. I can remember saying that many times, my kid won't do anything like that. And uh, it happened and still, I, I think a lot of times I denied uh, knowing or thinking that he would you know, be that much involved with it. Well, you wouldn't be the first parent. No, I know that now, for sure. You know, from that 17, when he first experimented with the beer and the Xanax, and as he, as he got older and started progressing, he got to where he, at some point, he knew that he had the addiction. He knew that he had it, and he hated it. He hated it. I loved that child so much that I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. His parents say Chris checked himself into rehab treatment twice, but the temptations were always there. Peer pressure and pals with pills, and yes, his own weaknesses. Back in Houston, we wanted to see for ourselves how easy it is to get these types of drugs. Three of our reporters, each going to a clinic only once, were able to buy all of these. All of our reporters used out-of-state IDs, which presented no problems. They just had to fill out a little paperwork, say they were in pain, ranking it on a scale of 1 to 10. Each was given signed prescriptions and directions to a nearby pharmacy with assurances that those prescriptions would be filled. The total, 600 pills, mostly powerful muscle relaxers and painkillers, easily enough for a deadly overdose or big profits when marked up on the street. It may surprise you to know, according to the DEA, that narcotic painkillers now cause more drug overdose deaths than cocaine and heroin combined. I just think it's a big problem, and it's a problem that a lot of people aren't aware of, but it's happening everywhere, and before, you know, 
I would just like to see something done about it before anybody else, you know, loses someone as important to them as he was to me. Jessica is Chris Scarborough's baby sister. She's still haunted by a day in September of 2007. Just five days earlier, her older brother had walked into a pill mill. I got it about a month after Chris died. It's just a broken heart with the date of his death. Uh, he died on the 23rd and I came in from Austin on the 22nd. And um, we all went out to dinner and, you know, had a good time and just joking around laughing, you know, and he was just same old Chris and that night he just, next morning he just didn't wake up. So I was glad that I got to, to spend that last night with him, you know. The paramedics shocked him and it didn't work and then they uh, shocked him again and it, it didn't work. And they said they couldn't do it anymore and I said, oh, please just try one more time. And uh, it just didn't work. And we found out later that uh, his heart had slowed so much that his lungs just filled up with fluid from the medicine. And uh, till to this day, it just seems like it's just a nightmare. No mother should have to try to revive their child. Christopher Scarborough was 25 years old cause of death was combined drug toxicity from the exact three drugs that he was had been prescribed by his clinic. And they were? Vicodin, Soma, and Xanax. Those three and only those three. Was that one of the bottles? That's one of the bottles. A bottle that big. Mm -hmm. in, in my view, would be no different than if he had gone to the doctor and said, you know, I'm just a little depressed. I'm depressed and I don't really know what I want to do. And so given pills, the doctor would say, well, I'll tell you what, um, just go ahead and take this pistol and these six bullets and go out to the shooting range and you know, make yourself feel better, just do a little target practice. Three hundred and sixty pills. It says take one tablet by mouth four times daily. And this is uh, hydrocodone. hydrocodone. That's the Vicodin. Mm -hmm. And that bottle was full. Mm -hmm. A lot of pills. So we know there are bad doctors, and the and the bona fide medical community wants to work with the regulatory and law enforcement community to stop those doctors. Dr. Russell Portnoy is chairman of the Department of Pain Medicine and Palliative Care at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York. He says the majority of doctors take their ethical responsibility seriously and says these medications, while subject to abuse, are also a godsend for millions of Americans who suffer from real chronic pain, many of whom, he says, are undertreated. Here we have a group of medications that are incredibly powerful and the best we have to relieve pain. But we know that some people who get these drugs will become addicted to them, lose control, develop compulsive use, and continue to use them even though they produce great harm. So that's the great challenge, trying to decide who should have access to these drugs that can be of such great benefit, but also carry very significant risk. And for those reasons, he says, responsible doctors would rarely give the most powerful pain medications to a patient on a first visit, adding that any mixing of drugs should always be under careful supervision. That kind of combination therapy is absolutely fine when it's administered by somebody who knows what he or she is doing. Typically, the drugs are added one at a time so that you can judge the effect before adding the next one. And, and even as each one is added, the overall regimen has to be reevaluated. And if it's not working for the patient in terms of benefit over risk, the regimen has to be stopped or changed. The Drug Enforcement Administration says that doctor involvement in illegal drug activity is rare. Less than 1% of more than 750,000 doctors have come under investigation. Many states have strict regulations about who can prescribe these drugs. Texas isn't one of them. 
the pain management clinics are really legitimate. There are a lot of good ones in the state. We want those guys to be able to keep practicing, but uh, we want to hang out the you're not welcome sign for the pill mills. Texas State Senator Tommy Williams' district lies within the pill mill hotbed of Southeast Texas. Just in two of the six counties I represent, in 2006, we had over 100 deaths from prescription drug overdoses. After emotional testimony from both law enforcement and bereaved families, including the Scarboroughs, Williams proposed two laws that he says will make it difficult for pill mills to function the way they do. It sailed through 142 to nothing in the House and 31 to nothing in the Senate. Clinics will have to be owned and operated by licensed physicians in Texas and up for review every two years. Under this law, Texas would also add all categories of narcotics to a database that tracks prescriptions for drugs like the ones distributed by pill mills. This will make it more difficult for any one individual to fill multiple prescriptions in a period of less than 30 days. What I would hope to tell you is that we've shut them down in Texas and there aren't any pill mills operating anymore. Small steps. I mean, it's, it, we'll take what we can get. Police officer John Kowal fears addicts will continue to get their fix unless there's a change in how the drugs themselves are classified. Nurse practitioners, physician's assistants could not then issue those prescriptions. Only a licensed medical doctor could. If the pharmaceutical companies, the lobbying associations, the medical societies would get behind us and say, yeah, let's try it and see what happens, I think we might see a marked decrease in the number of emergency room visits from people overdosing. I have one here from a father that says, um, I would like to take this time to write you. Since they told their story before the Texas legislature, the Scarboroughs have been overwhelmed by the number of emails that have been pouring in. This has motivated them to set up an organization to assist others like themselves, Parents Against Prescription Drug Abuse. They hope it can help others before it's too late. I mean, right now, as we sit here tonight, right now, there's a family somewhere, I promise you, there's a family somewhere. Tomorrow, next day, maybe the next 72 hours, their, their child is not going to wake up. They don't know it yet. They don't know it yet. But their child is not going to wake up. He or she is happy and healthy right now, but they're not going to wake up. And the reason they're not going to wake up is because they cross paths with a dirty doctor and a dirty pharmacist. The clinic and the pharmacy where Christopher Scarborough got his pills were shut down. The doctor who oversaw the clinic is still practicing medicine, but currently cannot prescribe prescription painkillers. In a moment, so many drugs and now so many victims. Meet an attorney who is not just going after the clinics, but the pharmacies and the companies that supply them. So stay here with us. Missed an edition of Dan Rather Reports? Or just want to see one again? We're now available on iTunes. So check us out. Welcome back to Austin. Here in Texas, it's been difficult to prosecute the so-called dirty doctors and pharmacists who keep the pill mill system running, leaving what families of overdose victims feel is little, if any, justice. So now, a conversation with Kay Van Way a Dallas attorney representing some of those families. Her mission, she says, is to make sure that someone is held accountable, even if it means going all the way to the top. Imagine going into your doctor and saying, I've got a backache and my nerves are bothering me and I'd like 120 Vicodin and 60 muscle relaxers and 120 Xanax most of our doctors who are good doctors would look at us as if we had lost our minds. And in Chris Scarborough's case, a 25-year-old young man, to walk into a pain clinic in a strip shopping center, you don't have to be a 
really sophisticated person to say that doesn't pass the smell test. When you go into the clinics, nobody gives you a thorough physical examination. Nobody gives you a diagnostic uh, examination. It's basically you say, my back hurts or my neck hurts, and they prescribe. Is that not the case? If the clinic is seeing 80 to 100 to 120 patients a day, there's not time to get any information from the patient other than what do you want. There's no time to perform a physical examination or to read uh, medical records to see what the true nature of their problem is or whether they have one. Well, the doctors who are associated with these pill mills, quote, pain clinics, you think by and large they know what they're doing? I think there's two varieties of doctors that get caught up in these sorts of things. I think there's a doctor who is perhaps poorly trained, misinformed, and who uh, just doesn't have very tight controls on the controlled substances that go out of their door. I think there's another kind of doctor who knows darn good and well what they're doing, and they go into it with the mindset of just running as many people through the clinic as they possibly can and writing them prescriptions for whatever they ask for, whether they need it or not. Now let's turn to the pharmacists. Most pharmacists I know are very well trained, integrity filled. What about the pharmacists involved in these kinds of operations? Well, there are different varieties of pharmacists as well, and I agree with you that there are many who are well trained and conscientious. There are some who are uh, good business people who decide that there is a market for these drugs. And if they fill one questionable prescription on Monday, then on Tuesday there will be five people from the same clinic at their door, mostly cash paying people. If they fill those five, by Wednesday there will be 15 people there. By Thursday there will be 30, and by Friday there will be 50. You seem to emphasize that they be cash customers. Where does that fit into the equation? Because you have to report it on your taxes, or do you? Well, um, I think that remains to be seen. Now let's go up the chain to the wholesalers. The wholesalers know, they can see on where they're putting the, the drugs. Right. That suddenly it spikes up at a pharmacy that just happens to be next door to the clinic or just down the street from the clinic. You think they know what they're doing? Well, the distributors are supposed to have plans in place, a program in place for monitoring these things. Uh, the DEA has put it on the, the backs of the distributors to know who their customers are. And the DEA has made it known that they're going to hold the distributors responsible if they're distributing to a pharmacy that's filling pill mill prescriptions. And so many of the larger wholesalers have implemented programs where they go and photograph the pharmacy. They determine where it's located. Is it located within the confines of an oncology clinic or is it a just a little mom and pop pharmacy out in the middle of nowhere that's distributing off the chart amounts of painkillers and muscle relaxers and things like that. Now let's carry it up to the ultimate top of the pyramid with the big pharmaceutical companies. Do they know what's happening, what's really happening in the pharmaceutical companies? Well, sure they do. I mean, they're in the business of selling pills and they know who their customers are as well. They have a very intricate database so that they know exactly, even down to the level of the doctor, which doctors are their better prescribers. And they employ a very sophisticated sales force to make sure that the sales are optimized and that the physicians understand why drug A is better than drug B. Let me play devil's advocate for a moment. I'm the CEO of a big pharmaceutical company. See, what happens to these pills once we manufacture them, once we distribute them? Uh, it's not my business. To that, you would say what? Well, I think they also, if, if I may, I think what they also say is, we do great things for people. And I don't doubt that they do. Some of these drugs do help people who genuinely Point. need them. There's no doubt about that. But these pharmaceutical executives also want to lay it on the backs of the individual by saying this is a problem created by individuals 
who are out to trick these doctors into prescribing things. But if I'm the business person, I say with all respect, I'm not a policeman. I'm not in the police business. Again, madam, I'm in business here to make money. And thank you very much. Our business is going quite well. Well, that's fine if you're selling cars or washing machines. But when you're selling dangerous prescription drugs who are killing people, and when we have a prescription drug epidemic in this country where, I, I can't cite the statistic to you right now, but there are millions of people in this country who are currently addicted to prescription drugs. You use the phrase, we have a prescription drug epidemic. Do we, or is that an overstatement? More people are addicted to prescription drugs in the United States than are addicted to cocaine, heroin, methamphetamines, and other drugs. Um, prescription drug addiction is second only to marijuana, and I would submit that it deserves more attention because people aren't dying of marijuana overdoses. But every single day in this country, many people are dying of prescription drug overdoses. It's not a celebrity problem, and it's not the bum living under the bridge problem either. This, these are our teachers and our mothers and our children. These are ordinary Americans. But we've all been raised on this notion that pills are good for us, and people wouldn't manufacture them, and doctors wouldn't prescribe them if they weren't good for us. And we've become a pill-popping society. You know, some have referred to us as Generation Rx because there's a pill for everything. But there remains that question, well, what about the patients and their own personal responsibility? We're a country that believes right. in personal responsibility. And doesn't the blame for this really start with the people who take the pills? I, too, believe in personal responsibility. But even the medical community recognizes that drug addiction is a medical disease. Let me just use an example. I know it is wrong to draw more money out of my bank account than I know is in there. I shouldn't write a check if I know I don't have the money to cover it. But if I had a criminal holding a, a gun at my head and saying, draw money out of that ATM, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get the money. The addiction is the criminal holding the gun at your head and making good people do things that they ordinar ordinarily wouldn't do. You meet with clients, people who feel that they're They've lost loved ones. Um, they're obviously depressed, uh, but they're also angry. What's your advice to clients? Well, um, there's a lot of people that I can't help. Um, many of these pill mills are run by some pretty shady people who we can't even find to serve a subpoena on them or to serve them with lawsuit papers. And then we have the situation with the pharmacist where they say, well, it's really the doctor's responsibility to make sure that the prescription is legitimate and all we do is fill prescriptions and, and so on and so forth down the line. But I'm just shocked by how many people are sitting on the sidelines wringing their hands and saying, well, it's too difficult. There's nothing that can be done about it. Let's talk about accountability. Is Congress and the regulatory agencies doing the job on these cases and with this situation that they should be doing? Absolutely not. The problem is continuing to escalate. And many of these pill mills, as I call them, are operating right under the noses of law enforcement. And we have legislation. I hear calls, well, we need more legislation. Well, we need to form a committee. Well, we need more collaboration. But the truth of the matter is, is that the laws have been on the books for over 90 years. It is illegal to divert a controlled substance for anything other than a legitimate medical purpose. What about state legislatures? They could solve this problem if they chose to do so, or could they? The Texas legislature, as you know, has taken a step recently to require that uh, pain clinics be owned by physicians and that the physician actually be on site a certain amount of time. But again, I don't 
know that legislation is the key. Enforcement of the legislation that's on the books is the key. All the laws in the world are no good if they're not enforced. If you had the CEO of one of the major wholesalers, one of the major distributors, one of the major middlemen, if you will, or, and or the CEO of one of the big pharmaceutical companies who are making a ton of money out of this, what would you say to them? I don't know that there's anything that I could say that wouldn't fall on deaf ears. And I just think it's the nature of the beast. And the beast is about making money and making money at all costs. Attorney Kay Van Way. Most states, not all, but most, have a prescription drug monitoring program that prevents patients from going doctor to doctor and getting prescription pills. That's called doctor shopping. Florida, another state with a booming pill mill problem, now has legislation that they hope will put an end to doctor shopping. Similar legislation here in Texas goes into effect in 2010. You may want to check and see how your state is doing, keeping a close eye on the pill mills and doctor shopping.